Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. I'm Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in Hernando County, and I'm here with my regular co-host once again this week, yes. Lily Browning, who is our Hernando County Florida-Friendly Landscape Coordinator. Good morning, Bill. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? I think I'm pretty good, yeah. Oh. <laughs> How many weeks in a row have we both been available? Oh, I don't know. At least three. Yeah, yeah. I think it's been three weeks. So. Break that next week. <laughs> I will not be here next week. I will be on vacation. But I'll be back the 16th. Yeah, I'm going to have to find a guest for next week. Who should I ask? Oh, I don't know. How about Jim Mall? I could. Mm-hmm. I need to get Laura on here, but I'll yeah. do that when the two of us are on here. Yep. Or maybe Jamie because of trees and hurricanes. Sure. I'll ask her. <laughs> Good morning, Basem. Good morning, buddy. <clears throat> okay. We have everybody tuning in now. Yes. So, buddy, hey, if you have any questions, life. just go ahead and put them in the uh, chat. And we'll do our best to figure out an answer for your question. Buddy wasn't in my class yesterday. It was hard to go on. I wasn't quite sure how to do it. Oh, no. <laughs> <Without him. laughs> yes. Good morning, Cindy. Well, you talked about pollinators? Pollinator plants, yes. Well, that's interesting. I, I could understand when we did irrigation because irrigation is boring. <laughs> yes. He did like it afterwards. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the cool thing about if you can't make um, our classes, you know, we record them. So that really is much more efficient for everybody so that you can watch, you know, whenever you want, whether that's from Tallahassee or Spring Hill or Morocco or wherever. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have um, people from Morocco on here? I know we have them trying to come on here, but. Um, I don't know. I'd have to look. I just, I guess it's on my mind because my son is headed that direction, that general direction on a military mission. Because, you know, that's the wisest thing to do is head right towards where the hurricanes originate. <laughs> well, they're not bad okay. over there. They don't get bad until they float all the way here. <laughs> True, yes. So, oh, good morning, Annette. Here we go. I'm going to share a link. Okay. To the Hernando County Government YouTube channel. And if you, you go have... to that <laughs> YouTube channel, here, let's go ahead and do that. How did you get that link like that? I just went to their main channel and that's what's up in the top bar. I just copy and paste. They may have only recently done that because I've been after them for a while to make a normal friendly URL. <clears throat> so I'm glad they have to go in and do that intentionally. Right, right. And then YouTube has to approve it because I went through that. Cool. And I'm pretty sure I was able to do it. I can't remember how much. Well, see, now I've learned something important today. Now I can start sharing <laughs> that link because usually I just tell them go to YouTube and look for Hernando County government because any link was, you know, 3,000 characters long. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So if you go to Hernando County government's YouTube channel, <clears throat> they have a number of different playlists. So if you click on playlists, and then you have one to for this one right here. They have one for the fire department. We, we're not too interested in that. Uh, they got one for the library. We're not too interested in that. Oh, sure we are. <laughs> they have one for extension, and they have one for Lily, the Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Program. And oh my goodness, look at all these recorded classes. Oh my gosh, <laughs> eighty-one videos. Uh, probably 82 by this afternoon. Um, yesterday should be finished by then. <laughs> okay, well, you have more than I do, because if we go yeah. back and we go to, I've been putting my 
classes that I create up here also. So if you go to my playlist, I only have 14 videos. Well, you know, some of us are influencers and some of us aren't. What can I tell you? <laughs> but there are a lot of the workshops that we've done over the last couple of years on here about growing sweet potatoes that had um, Wendy Mussolini with uh, extension. She's an extension expert on sweet potatoes. Calabasso with Dr. Maru, who's a researcher in South Florida that's working on them. Uh, Yi Lin did well water. Oh, I'm right and too. you see that we have a number of classes on here. Yeah. And I probably, I would say a good half of mine are, include you. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And yesterday I did a pollinator plant starter kit. And that one, it's on our Facebook pages. But um, for those, um, <laughs> Um, for those who prefer YouTube, because I know a lot of people say I will not do the Facebook, I won't do, but you know, they'll go to YouTube on their televisions or something like that. So let those people know. And like I said, there's going to be 82. <laughs> they can go down a rabbit hole. Um, and trying to make, you know, their nine principles <laughs> Florida friendly landscaping. <laughs> so. I do my best. I mean, a lot of it is repeat, and that's not a bad thing because that's how you learn. But I try to make each one somewhat different than the other one and come up with new stories or something, you know. So, and of course, you and I were learning all the time, so we can always bring mm -hmm. what we've just learned, you know, <clears throat> to the classes too. Have you covered mulch recently? My favorite topic. Uh, not recently. There's one oh. in there. What to do about mulch? Um, can't remember if you were in that one or not. It's funny you now. Do a whole I... mulch series, part one, part two, part three. <laughs> it's a great topic. Okay, you were impressed <laughs> years ago when I convinced you you could talk for an hour about mulch. I think beyond that is a little bit pushing it. <laughs> I do talk about you have to mulch. think outside the box in in yesterday's uh, program. I discussed mulch as how they pertain to wildflowers, how it pertains to wildflowers and actually go to scale way, 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 way back on your mulch. If you want wildflowers, because the idea of having them is so they can spread their seed. So bare dirt is really kind of preferable. Of course, you're going to have weeds. <laughs> but, yeah. but you know what? I have mulch in my wildflower bed and plenty of weeds too. But I had to learn the hard way and I talk about this um, in the class that I had yesterday that I, because I prefer that big uh, chunky pine nuggets, you know, mulch. Yeah. Not a great thing for a wildflower bed because, you know, it does take longer to break down. So that is a good thing in your other beds, but so I told them if you're going to think about mulch, just like a really, really thin, thin layer of maybe melaleuca mulch, you know, something. Oh, pine. I didn't think about that. Pine needles would be fantastic. Something to allow the seeds, you know, the flowers to go to seed and the seeds to spread. They need that contact with the bare dirt. Mm -hmm. and How about rubber mulch? How about no? <laughs> <laughs> Ground up tires. Yes. Well, there are several no's, reasons for no's for that. Um, part of the reason for mulch is to add to, you know, the, um, to make the soil a little better as the mulch decays. Mm -hmm. So those ground up tires are not adding anything good to the soil. And then we really got to stop and think about what are they adding to the soil? You know, petroleum, heavy metals, you know, all that stuff. Plus, um, it, you know, it, it just brings so much heat. Now, our wildflowers should be able to withstand the heat of our summers, but, you know, you don't see them in the middle of an asphalt road, so you don't create that in their bed. So, 
Oh, okay, you will see them in the middle of a highway, but they're on soil <laughs> there. Yeah, and that's a really tough place for them to pick plants in the center of a road. Mm -hmm. And I remember they had, we were asked by city of Brooksville and they had a problem because at one intersection in the middle of the road, they had society garlic planted. I remember and that. during the summer, if you pulled up and you're sitting there waiting at the red light, it smelled really, really strong like garlic because it really? doesn't off an actual garlic odor. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. I hadn't heard that story. I thought you were going to go with the methane killed the society garlic, not that the plant caused people to complain. Yeah, no, it, it did smell very strong like garlic, and not everybody appreciates that, I guess. I like garlic, but... Um, well, it was the vampires mainly who were probably complaining. Yeah. And then they had a problem with the Kuntis because DOT says plants can only be a certain height uh, in the... Um, median mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the kuntis got a little bit too tall and kuntis you can't really prune like a hedge you can't just go along with hedge clippers and trim the top unless you want to like butcher them right so why did they put them there in the first place because they're very tough and very durable they'll take a hot dry right. non-irrigated but spot. you're right you have to be able to see over except for like every how many feet they'll have a palm tree or something but if you notice not like right at the edge of the, if you're sitting there or driving you have to be able to look and see the other side mm -hmm. of the road so there can't be anything really blocking that dot has very specific rules about mm -hmm. plant height and width and everything else yep. which is why they and society garlic was the right size but monique says the society garlic is nasty so <laughs> And she lives in the city, so now we know who one of the complainers are. <laughs> um, I've never there. grown society garlic before, and I've never tried growing edible garlic. I need to try that. You have to grow it during the winter, mm -hmm. and you have to get the right type. Because with garlic, you have soft neck garlic and hard neck garlic and also elephant garlic. Elephant garlic grows well here, and I believe soft neck garlic grows well here. Hard neck garlic will not grow well in Florida. Grows great in California, but not in Florida. Yeah. Okay. But society garlic, since you're not eating it, you can grow it anytime, unless, of course, it offends you, apparently. I don't know if it's edible or not, or if it's a garlic substitute. You know how so yeah. many people are fixated on weeds and wildflowers and plants. What can I eat out in the woods? Maybe society garlic. I've never really heard of that. I um, kind of employed a better safe than sorry answer this week. Um, my, of course, it wasn't even for Florida. My son-in-law sent me a picture of a log rotting log with a mushroom of some sort coming out of it. And um, it's where his dogs, you know, are let outside. Mm -hmm. So he was concerned about that. And I said, well, I forwarded it on to my nephew in Washington State. This went all over the place because he's studying to be a mycologist. He's getting his master's. In that. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I said, but the answer I'm going to give you is don't take any chances, you know, and just move it. He thought it was cool to watch the log decay. And I said, well, if you remove that mushroom, the decaying is still going to happen. More fruiting bodies will show up. So just take yeah. it out of the dog's area and put it somewhere else, which is what I think he was going to do. Then my nephew said it's probably fine, <laughs> but I still would take the better safe than sorry route. Yeah, and it's a little bit different here in Florida because we have so many different species of mushrooms that can grow here. Just assume they're poisonous. Yeah, I mean, if you, you can go out in the woods collecting mushrooms way up north, up in Minnesota, Michigan. You could probably do it in Pennsylvania pretty safely. I wouldn't do it in Florida. No. Maybe what you pick you'll identify correctly. Maybe not. 
there's because like I said, there's a lot more here. And we do not recommend that people pick mushrooms in the wild here in Florida. And if they send us pic if you send me a picture and say that your dog ate it, I'll forward it to Matt Smith, the Dr. Smith at University of Florida, who's the mycologist, and he'll identify it as best he can and tell you, oh, it either is very dangerous or it's probably not dangerous. But we're well, not going to recommend that you that, eat it. In that situation, if your dog ate it, don't call anybody at the University of Florida except the veterinary clinic I mean, or your vet. Or, you know, there is a poison control for animals, too. You should have that on hand, you know. But Take even a lot of veterinarians don't know that we can help in that area. So if you need a mushroom identified, take a bunch of really good pictures of it, email it to me, and I'll forward it to Dr. Smith up there in Gainesville. Every time I've done it in the past, he's gotten right back with me. But step one is calling the vet. <laughs> then if the vet needs help, then you can step in. Yeah. And Daniel says a society garlic can be an herb substitute. Lily, you'll have to try that sometime and let us know. <laughs> I, I will uh, rely on Dan. <laughs> so, to, I to still prefer it. the majority of my food to come from the grocery store. Things like <laughs> mushrooms. I love mushrooms. My mushrooms come from the grocery store. Yes. Now you have your vegetables in the backyard, but they're known entities. They are not yeah. something that you found in the yard. Yeah. And since I have such a wide variety of different things growing in my lawn, also known as weeds, um, I'm sure that plenty of them are edible. I've never really been all that interested in trying them though. Not that hungry yet, are you? No, no. We're not at that point yet. No, it's, very good to know if you ever end up being on one of those TV shows <laughs> where they drop you off, but they're going to drop you off in Belize or Africa or somewhere. And the plants there are totally different. So, okay. I'd be kind of in a tough, they drop me off in Belize. I'm like, what in the heck is growing here? Can I eat that safely? We were talking um, before the, before we went on air, I was saying um, there's a game changer in my life now as far as weeds go, weeds that pop up, you know, in, in those flower beds that I have. And, you know, what it's always been before, because you got to remember, we work 40 plus hours a week. So my front flower bed, which is full of beautiful, mostly sages right now, but some other things. Also a whole lot of Bermuda grass. I hate and, and other weeds in there, but nothing that I despise as much as the Bermuda grass. And what I would do is like sometime in July, um, end up when the Bermuda grass was higher than anything else, you know, taking a day or so to just be pulling and pulling that out. Well, my husband found a weed eater that is very lightweight and runs by battery. So that's really most of the weight is one of those, you know, Ryobi or whatever, you know, battery mm -hmm. packs that you stick on there. I don't know if that was the brand, but. Um, yeah, it is. No, I don't know if it was the brand of what I have. Oh, okay. Um, so now, because nobody, everybody else is afraid to weed eat around my flower beds because they don't understand what I want and what I don't want. <laughs> So now I have more ability. I'm never going to, you know, eradicate those weeds out of there. But I'll be able to at least keep them down, you know, do that once or once a week or so early in the morning. And I think that's going to be a game changer for a lot of my plant beds. And if I happen to accidentally whack down the wrong thing, I can only be mad at me. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have. Our dog area in the backyard is very, very heavy. Uh, well, it's really half Bermuda and half fog fruit. Kind of a strange yeah. mixture. Yeah, the fog fruit is fine. Mm -hmm. Say that five times fast. So every summer, I will get the uh, the green June bugs, and they're the very large with a green back. Um, 
June bugs, a good sized beetle. Mm. I get literally a hundred of them emerging from back there, and they're flying around. The dog's looking all confused, like, what the heck is this? <laughs> um, later in the summer, tons of butterflies from the fog fruit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the dogs go out there and take care of business, and that's where I park the RV. So a good, a big rectangle in the center is now dead, and everything's just fine with me. No, I don't need a perfect lawn. Oh, absolutely. For sure. And I tried to take the Bermuda bread out. Bermuda. Bermuda bread. <laughs> Bermuda grass. <laughs> um, you know that diet that the ladies in your office are following? <laughs> yeah, I've heard rumors. I, I'm doing it too. So perhaps uh, that's why I said bread. <laughs> Hungry. Anyway, um, um, Bermuda grass. I try to pull it out of those beds and throw it into the lawn areas where I wish it would, you know, take, you know, take hold there because to me in the lawn areas, anything that is green and mobile and looks like grass will be fine, but it won't take there. It wants the nicer um, soil that's in the beds, you know, that is built up over the years. St. Augustine does the same thing. It grows the best in your flower beds where you don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have we have everybody uh sharing recipes now for society garlic and lee has volunteered to try some and dan apparently has tried it in the past uh he's sharing exactly how to use it on your steaks so uh we do not officially recommend this please be careful when eating unknown plants in your garden or your yard Well, Dan seems to have lived through it, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, he's tried it and it didn't kill him or, you know, mm -hmm. damage him too badly. <laughs> so, hey, if you have any other lawn and garden questions, just feel free to go ahead and share them in the chat. I will be Saturday in downtown Brooksville. Um right behind the main library. Monique, come on by. And um, <clears throat> at the Hurricane Expo. So um, come by and see me if you're going to be there. It's from 10 to 2. As I said yesterday in my class, um, come join us. Bring a fan and a nice cool drink. And maybe one for you too. And uh, <laughs> If you want to see, if you want to see me, bring me a fan and a cool drink. No, I will have those things. Um, my helper is going to be Dr. Bill Lester. No. Um, oh no, I won't be there. <laughs> mm -mm -mm -mm. Native plant expert Rita Grant will be there with me. You got native plant questions? Come on by. What does that have to here? do with hurricanes? <laughs> Um, we can also talk about hurricane safety in your landscape. I don't know what native plants have to do with hurricanes, but I know that I need someone to help me put up the canopy and <laughs> set everything up. And, uh, you know, certain people maybe with a doctor in front of their name have not volunteered to do so. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not going to be there. <laughs> so, um, it's a community event. We'll show up at mm -hmm. community events. And um, we may have a tropical system kind of scooching by us, bringing a lot of rain. On what Saturday. I'm hoping for is that it just makes it cloudy and cool. But it would be ironic if it was, uh, if it delayed the whole, <laughs> if the Hurricane Expo was delayed because of rain. But <laughs> It'll be drizzly, steamy, and scorching hot. Thank you. <laughs> we so, have some questions. Good. So Bassam asks, what is the best method to get rid of the mealybugs on hibiscus? That's a very easy one. This time of year, insecticidal soap is going to work just fine. You're probably going to have to use it more than once. But if you spray insecticidal soap and you can get that, you know, you can get everything on Amazon now. You can get insecticidal soap, 
a lot of different pesticides and new things that I get emails about or read about that you probably would not see in a big box store for the next 10 years, you can already buy online. So that's kind of a bonus if you know what you're looking for. So get some insecticidal soap, use it. During the winter, like from fall through spring, you could use uh, horticultural oil. That works really well. And mealybugs can be around almost year round when it gets really, really cold. Most, most insect pests disappear for at least a little bit. But you could try oil in the winter and insecticidal soap now that it's hot and sunny. My hibiscus are just coming back. They're only like a foot tall. They don't have any flowers or anything yet. And Monique asks about milorganite, which is a type of fertilizer from Milwaukee? Yes. Yes, it is okay. from Milwaukee. Very good. Yep. So they take... Um, from from the proud... Uh, Residents. Uh -huh. of Milwaukee. <laughs> yes. Okay, Monique just set us up perfectly to mention poo in our broadcast. Here we together. go. <laughs> 1026. We did. Yeah, we're going to have to start having a contest or measuring <laughs> that or something. <laughs> Give away a free t shirt to the first person who gets us to say the word poo on the broadcast. <laughs> But this is a fertilizer that's made um, from the municipal waste up there in Milwaukee. <clears throat> it's disinfected, the bacteria is killed, it's cleaned, it's dried, and it makes an okay fertilizer. Yes, that's correct. It is Mo Milwaukee poop. Um, but it has trace amounts of different heavy metals in it. So if you use too much or if you use it too often, those heavy metals may start to build up in the soil, and that's not a good thing. I'm pretty sure that they were able to reduce the amount of heavy metals in milorganite, although it's still present. And with any kind of um, fertilizer like that, because growers and people who have pastures, you can buy it by the truckload. Mm -hmm. You're only supposed to apply it maybe once a year. So there is a limit on how much and how often you can apply it. But for a homeowner, you can use milorganite. Milorganite is not really good for lawns because the percentage of nitrogen and potassium is out of whack for lawns. Mm -hmm. It's not ideal. It has both, but the percentages aren't ideal for a lawn. <clears throat> so you can use it, but I really wouldn't use it more than maybe once a year. Yep. And we are going to one day have a similar product here in Hernando County. Um, it's always five years away. <laughs> we, tease, we tease Carmen about that. Um, Coming Carmen, soon. Yeah, Carmen Bruno um, is our recycling coordinator um, up at our Hernando County landfill. And what his, his um, you know, it's going to be his, this, um, moving is a compost program at the landfill. And, well, I'm Susan, I'm answering your question right now. So what eventually will occur is they will take, you know, all the uh, yard waste, you know, uh, all the landscape material that they have, you know, already take and put in the unlined cell or whatever, but the landscape material, they have some piles of it now um, without this one product. <laughs> they just have the landscape kind of material and they will um, chip it up. And uh, eventually, Hernando County Utilities will be providing them a product to add to it, <laughs> which will be sludge. So any of you from Spring Hill um, on our sewer system, you get to be proud um, participants in this program. Now remember the sludge is- So will it be Spring Hill poop? Yes, it will. Okay. And um, for those who are on the sewer system, not for those of you in the-, in yeah, the yeah. Who have, what you call it, septic tanks. Um, so it'll be sludge, which is very much cleaned out. And sludge is really 
it is the exoskeletons of the microbes that you know dissolve the waste so it's not like you're you know just putting big piles of poo out there it is very much processed and then when it's added to um the piles of mulched up you know landscape material it, it has to follow very specific rules of getting to certain temp what's the temperature bill hundred I think the temperature is like 150. Yeah. Although it, it can very easily get up to 160 or above. If it gets above 160, that's I too think it is. Yeah. And it has to do this several times, not just once. Mm -hmm. it, it has to get there. Then they have to turn the pile over and do it like three or four times over, you know, a period of time before then it can be considered. I don't know whether it's officially pasteurized, but it is, you know, safe for us to be able to use. And by that point, when they've got that going, you'll be able to go up there and get it by the truckload or smaller bags, um, you know, and purchase it. And be great um, if you are putting down new sod. As you mentioned, that St. Augustine grass loves to go and grow in flower beds. Mm -hmm. Well, let's provide the flower bed type environment, you know, <laughs> when we put it down and maybe it'll be happier or you can just use it um to top dress your lawns too so i and i think it'll be a great thing once we get that really going yeah because monique asks what's currently a good non-synthetic fertilizer for lawns love the black cow but i can't do my entire yard too expensive so in just in just a few years <laughs> soon, coming up <laughs> I know um, part of the plan for what Carmen Bruno is doing up at the landfill is to offer this um, compost product to county residents. And whether you bring a pickup truck up there or you buy a dump truck load and have it brought to your house or you want to go up there and just purchase a couple bags, I believe they're still planning on bagging it. Mm -hmm. It'll be offered for very inexpensively uh for county residents i believe they have to charge at least enough to cover their costs and plastic bags aren't free the bagging machine's not free but it'll be um very affordable that's what they're aiming for and this would be absolutely perfect for lawns but right uh, now um right now you can look into off brands you don't have to get the black cow brand of composted cow manure i think they have store brands of it um, see if that's a little bit cheaper. Sure, they have compost, they have mushroom compost, anything like that scattered lightly over your lawn, your lawn's going to love. Mm -hmm. um, regular turf grass fertilizer obviously is designed for turf grass needs. Sure. The problem is um, many people basically over fertilize their lawns. I know the services Oh my gosh, the fertilizer services are not shy with the fertilizer. They'll they'll insist that it needs to be fertilized three, four, five, six times a year, and it doesn't need anywhere near that much fertilizer. What's a good thing to use um, as summer approaches if your lawn starts yellowing up? Uh, application of iron. So Don't you, you can love use... when I feed him questions that I know the answers to. <laughs> You can use uh, an iron supplement like Ironite, I-R-O-N-I-T-E, and that's at Lawn and Garden Centers. The foliar spray. Foliar spray is probably going to work better. The Ironite granule, see, iron is a really funny plant nutrient because plants need iron, and if plants don't have iron, the, the leaves, they don't turn yellow, they turn literally white. You don't see it very often, but grass can benefit from iron in the summer because that way it'll make it greener, so you're happy, but it doesn't grow faster, so whoever's cutting your grass is happy also. The problem is there's a lot of different forms of iron. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the cheaper supplements are um, iron iron oxide and do you know what that is yes i know what that is what do you mean what is that iron oxide uh-huh it's rust i was gonna say yeah yes plants can't take up rust 
plants can take up certain forms of iron and some forms they take up better than other ones so if you have a legitimate iron deficiency you really want to get an iron supplement but you want to get a more expensive one than a cheap one because the cheap ones sometimes are not very good or don't work very well fortunately plants rarely get a legitimate iron deficiency mm -hmm. Happens very rarely, and it's kind of unusual when we see that happen. Malorganite for iron? I don't know if malorganite contains iron or not. You really have to check the label. Um, fertilizer labels will tell you a lot. So when you get a bag of fertilizer, forget the picture on the front, forget the fancy name or the cute name or the picture of puppies and children rolling in the ground. Forget all that. <laughs> you can even forget most everything that's on the front of the bag. Flip it over and look through the ingredients and that tells you what is in it, like the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, iron, and anything else that it contains. And then read the ingredients and it tells you what ingredients it got those things from. Well, so if it says that it has iron, but it came from iron oxide, iron oxide is rust. So Monique says it has six percent iron. People they're uh, they are not anemic in Milwaukee, apparently. <laughs> See, I didn't know that. I learned something. Um sure you can use milorganite for uh iron supplement, but it really depends on what ingredient the iron came from. Sure. Because if I have any chemists in the audience today, you'll know that iron does exist in a number of different forms. Mm -hmm. And some plants readily take up, other forms it won't take up. It's amazing, you know, that all the different minerals and things that plants need as well. Um, yeah. And that is impacted a lot by pH. I you can have certain types of iron in your soil and if your pH is high your plants can't take it up and your plants may have a iron deficiency and you're like I added iron what's going on here your pH is way too high if it's your pH down. is way That's too sweet. low some of those things become very soluble and you'll have um either an iron or a zinc or some kind of unusual mineral toxicity Right. Because your pH got too low. There's a cool chart you can find that UF has that shows you, you know, pH is literally the key to lock or unlock um, some of these nutrients and whether or not it's a, it is available. And it is a cool chart that shows, you know, when your pH is, you know, low on the left side, <laughs> then, you know, iron is locked out or, or you know, various other elements and then when it's neutral pretty much everything you know can be absorbed and then as it gets higher there are other elements that are locked out it is really pretty interesting let me try looking that up oh my goodness we got a whole bunch <laughs> i was in where's teresa she's i'm surprised she hasn't shown it to us yet Now you can um, get your soil tested, can't you, Dr. Lester? Yes, you can. And then you will know what your pH level is. And that is the best place to start, really, instead of just guessing. And how you get it tested is you go to your county extension office, or you can even go you know, to their web page or the University of Florida's soil testing lab. Right, Bill? Yes, I'm and trying to find. I'm trying to find a chart. <laughs> and if you fill out a form, and you can either go to your extension office and ask for a soil testing kit. Some counties, I think Citrus County, will test your pH for you on site. You don't do that in Hernando because you don't feel that. Lake, that's Lake County does that also. Yeah, okay, that that's an accurate test. So you just send yeah, we it don't want to mess with that because you just send it all to the university. So. Go to your extension office, ask for a soil testing kit. 
or go online to the soil testing lab at the University of Florida, download the form, fill it out, and um, they'll give you a little bag. Or if you're doing it from home, you can provide your own bag, but you want it to be a paper bag, right? Right, Bill? Yes, bring your, your sample needs to be sent in a paper bag. Yes, and then, you know, you label each one. You're getting a, uh, you know, little pieces from all over your yard and dried out and then put in that bag. And then you'll call that sample one because you want to know for your lawn. Maybe you'll have one then for a vegetable garden and one for your beds. And those are $10 each now? Yes, they're currently $10 each. <laughs> you'll get your pH and lime requirement and several other nutrients for that price, correct? You, in, sometimes you'll get a box or you may have to provide your own box and get the address, mail it up to the lab at the University of Florida. You'll get your results emailed to you. So will Dr. Lester if you are in Hernando County. Um, so you can call him and say, Bill, I don't understand this at all. Explain it to me. And people do that. Mm -hmm. And here's that chart. Yes. And this is, it's a little small, a little hard to see. I didn't want to take the Getty images one and get in trouble for <laughs> copyright and this and that. So you took um, the UF one. Yes. But along the very top of the chart is the pH. And the pH on this chart runs from 4.0, which is very acidic on the far left hand side, up to 10 which is higher than what you have anywhere in Florida. The highest you have in Florida is 8.5. To get higher than that, there has to be a ton of salts in the soil, like out in the, like New Mexico has pH oh, okay. come up in the tents. Hmm. I but didn't know that. pH impacts how soluble the nutrient is and how available it is to plants. And this chart, is a little bit deceptive, especially with phosphorus, although this one doesn't look too bad. Phosphorus is only freely available in a small range, right around between maybe six and seven. pH higher than that, you're gonna have, ph phosphorus won't be as available. pH is lower, it's not very available. Which it just so happens that our average uh, soil test kit here in, in uh, Fernando County comes back as what, about 6.5, almost? Higher. Higher. I, I would say average of seven or a little bit above. Hmm. Okay. Brooksville itself, like where Monique lives, might be down in the 6.5 because they're more of an ochamic. Um, and people weigh on the eastern side of the county. And if you live out in the country and you're testing like native soil, Sure. It tends to be slight lower pH. Okay, that's what I was thinking. So we're talking. You're talking about fill dirt, <laughs> basically. Oh, fill dirt! Oh my gosh, I got um, um, a soil test from somewhere in the rural highlands, and his pH was eight point five, and the phosphorus level was zero point zero, zero phosphorus. You know what hates a high pH? Bahia grass. Yes. And I think that's what his problem was. They they built the house. They brought fill dirt in. They dug a big hole out behind him and just threw it in his yard, threw the turf grass on top of it. I remember you telling me about that. He must live right on top of uh, an, uh, an old mine yeah. to have, you know, to have that kind of high pH. Yeah. So if, if you're dealing with fill dirt, what soil you have, it could be anything. And I think I, a fun experiment really unusual... would be, um, maybe I'll do this for the fun of it. <laughs> um, of course, now my home has been there 14 years, but um, guess what I dug up two days ago when I was planting new plants in my wildflower bed? Buried treasure? But yeah, cement block, you know, pieces oh. of cement block 14 Beard years man. later. Um, so be interesting to do a soil test on where they put in fill dirt to build the house and then go to that new lot I just built where I bought where nothing has been built. It's the natural soil and do one there yeah. and, and find the difference. We should do that. Yeah. 
Yeah, we should. Run that for me, Dr. Lester, <laughs> as an experiment. Well, if you want to bring the samples over and we fill out the sheets, I should be able to throw my business card in and get it for free. Cool. I haven't yeah. tried that for a while, but they there used to do that. Now they'll just send me a bill. <laughs> And then you'll send it to me. <laughs> so it'll still work out. You say, hey, we're, we're not doing this test for free. Yeah. But they they used to. They're very nice people up there. I would do it on some of the newer homes, but, you know, they probably don't want me in their yard digging up little pieces of soil. <laughs> They've got cameras. Uh, we, I mean, we can look house. around for people who have just gotten a house built. Yeah, cool. Within the last six months, that would and, be take, and check a few just to just for comparison. Yeah. Or I can even probably get some um, before the sod is put down. But like I said, you know they have cameras and stuff now in these new houses. <laughs> well, just take some soil. Don't steal the air conditioning unit or anything. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> We're not telling you to break in and start taking copper pipes. County employee arrested for stealing <laughs> dirt from new home bill. I was just taking a soil sample. Sure you were. <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> <coughs> guys, looks like we're getting kind of close here. So if you have any other burning lawn and garden questions or comments or anything, feel free to jump right in the chat. Okay, and, uh, I'm going to bring up a subject you said was boring, but we're going to bring it up. Anyway, okay. in our last 14 minutes here, um, it's June 2nd. So what should we be thinking about in our landscape in the event that we have a big storm come through Hernando County? We should focus on cookouts and hanging out by the pool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's that time of year. Ours what is warm. What have we already have done? four or five months ago. <laughs> what about trees? What should we look for with trees? I got to trim my palm trees. I'm way behind on that. Okay, that's a good segue. You're being uh -huh. very difficult this morning, you know, by the way. Um, what if someone comes to your door, knocks on your door and says, hey, you know, for 500 bucks, I'll hurricane prune your palms. Well, we have a ring doorbell. So first of all, my phone goes nuts. And then I peek out the window. And of course, the dog just walks straight to the door and just stares through the glass out of him. Doesn't bark. Just, who's that? Are they going to come in and pet me? Somebody visiting? And I ignore them until they go away. Is hurricane pruning palms a recommended um, activity? No. Is it even a thing? <laughs> It is a thing. I have to drive through um, uh, HOA subdivision to get to and from my house. I mean, I don't have to, but that's the way I choose to go. And oh my gosh, I see people getting their palms and they're done still. Washingtonia palms, uh, not so much queen palms, but other palms down to like one leaf. One right. lonely little leaf sticking out on the very top. And they do it all the time. Is that a suggested practice by the University of Florida or any arborist no, ever from, known? From a plant health perspective, it's horrible for your palm tree. Horrible. And think about it. Hurricanes, palm trees. They've kind of been coexisting since the beginning of time. Yes. And actually, well, the recommended... Um, pruning of a palm tree. Okay, well, Monique can just take over. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to go do some paperwork. Y'all don't need paperwork. <laughs> yeah. Monique says 9 and 3 o'clock for a palm trimming. She's absolutely correct. What she means by that is here, I'll show you. my. Uh -huh. um, this is 9 and 3 o'clock for your palm tree. Anything above this, leave it alone. And, you know, what's going to happen works better for certain species than it does for others. <clears throat> cabbage palm, that's perfect. Because a cabbage palm in the wild is going to make kind of a ball shape. And if you trim it at nine and three, that's absolutely perfect. Queen palms, because Cindy said she just got her queen palms done. 
they have much longer leaves. True, they're going <laughs> to droop down. And they'll yeah. start to droop down. And ideally, you don't want to trim them off until they're completely brown. Ideally. But completely if you have a house brown. like mine, where they put a queen palm too close to the front door, and when the leaf droops, one lays on the roof, the other one blocks the front doorway, so it really gets in the way of the Amazon delivery people. <laughs> and the other way, other one hangs down. You may have to remove them before you ideally would, just because of the natural um, way the queen palms grow. Okay, but you kind of hit on a point there too without realizing it. Cabbage palm, native, natural to this area. Queen palms are not. Yeah. And they're actually a pretty weak tree. They come down quite a bit in storms. They're not ideal. I mean, they have good points and bad points. They're fast growing. Which generally always means weak. Fast growing almost always means weak. So they if you have. But they don't. Very few people have queen palms that they've had for like 20 years or more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so if you have other trees out there that you know are getting old and weak, your camphor trees, which are invasive plants anyway, um, they're not going to do great through a storm. So, you know, trying to get hold of an arborist now, I mean, do it if you haven't done it. But if there's an actual hurricane bearing down, that is not the time to call the tree guys to come out to your house because they're going to be very, 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 very busy. May or may not get to you. The time to do that was, you know, before. And they, I would have an arborist, a certified arborist, and go to treesaregood.org. Mm -hmm. And you can find... <coughs> um they have a search and you can do within 30 miles of your zip code all the certified arborists and um, have one come and do an evaluation do you know who's going to be a certified arborist soon you yes ma'am cool i i finally got around to it i as a matter of fact i just got in my email the uh, receipt for me paying for the test now i just have to schedule it I got to drive to Tampa and take it at one of those computer testing centers. I'm going to do it middle of July. So I'll be gone for a day taking a arborist test. So call Bill so he can come to your house <laughs> and evaluate your trees. Okay, well, and that says she just moved into a brand new house on December 31st. You can come by and get a soil sample. So. Cool. You, me, as in me, yes. How about we? <laughs> you know, we could do that. Um, yeah. And that, if you want to shoot either one of us an email or both of us an email, uh -huh. let me go ahead and start putting them up. That would be, a, yeah, that would be very helpful. That way we would have the brand new filter, the 14-year-old filter, and then natural soil and just compare the, the different uh, pHs and other elements. Yeah, There's because it, it varies a lot. And they're sometimes, and I don't know where they get some of this fill dirt from, but some of it is just absolutely the worst material to try to grow a lawn on top of. Which is why that circles back to that compost product. When we get that really up and running, we, I know Carmen, his dream, one of his dreams is to start some kind of incentive program with the um, sod companies that will come to the new homes that they get incentivized to apply the compost product before they put down the lawn so that will be fantastic there's been um tests they've been doing this for what probably seven eight years now in on top of the world mm -hmm. dr evan dean has been doing it with a product you can purchase um, called Command. So, um, Monique, look that up. Maybe it's out of your price range, too. I'm not sure what it costs. It's C-O-M-A-N-D, and it's made in Lake Panasofki. And it is similar type. Of, they, they won't share <laughs> what's in it. But it's a, you know, compost product that is not a fertilizer. And that is what they have 
been using to put down before New Sod in Marion County where they're running these tests with very good results. You know, we even have a class on that. Oh, let's stop that loud music there. <laughs> you get the cool guitar music. Huh? John gives you cool music. I, <laughs> I did get him to change the music that sounded like someone was sneaking up on you. <laughs> no, mine is more folksy. You, you get <clears throat> rock and roll music. You know, I wonder <laughs> if we could show a video here on StreamYard and we could all watch it together <clears throat> and we would be here live to answer questions. Watch party. That's, Facebook did that and it was called a, a watch party. Yes. Or, yes. Uh -huh. And they quit doing that. TikTok, I think, is doing it now where you, you are like on one half reacting where they're showing a video or something on the other half. Hmm. We Maybe we that. need to start doing a watch party. Watch ourselves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what that command looks like. Yes, up in um, on top of the world in Marion County and um, under, you know, under the soil where they had had it put down for a while. They're trying it many different ways. Sometimes they just lay it. Sometimes they till it in. But it's um, really adding to the nutrient holding and all water holding capacity of the soil. Of course, it goes through our sandy soil pretty quickly. So they're yeah. suggesting, what, once a year or so to then top dress it again with the same product. So if you are already past the point of new soil, you know, you can start using a compost product as a top dressing. It, it's certainly not going to hurt. And all of that information is in this recorded class. If you go to the Hernando County government's YouTube page and look under the uh, extension playlist, you'll see healthy lawns start from the ground up, which is very true. Do you see Susan's question? Yes. Susan says that some native Floridian told her the predominant tree was pine. She said any replanting after hurricanes was with palms for aesthetic reasons. Does that screw up the ecosystem? Yes and no. Um, different areas have different predominant trees that naturally grow there. Spring Hill was pine sand hill. Pines, thin grasses, and lots of sand. Brooksville is hardwood hammock. If you drive down there, there's hills, there's creeks, there's big old oak trees. Uh, there's, yeah, uh, pig nut hickories. There's mm -hmm. um, uh, lots and lots of different trees other than oaks and pines. A couple of pines, lots of oaks, but that is what would naturally be there. So when we go in and bulldoze things and put in palm trees or something else, then yeah, that is disrupting the ecosystem. Um, Which is why in a lot of um, areas, you know, such as in the Withlacoochee Forest, you know, people get upset when they go in and try to restore these lands to what they originally were, which could be mainly pine. And all that people see is people, them taking down the big <laughs> oak trees, which came in, see, the, and that's happening a lot where I am too, and that really should be just sandhill pine. But what happens is, and it wasn't all necessarily hurricanes, we had a boom town called Centralia, which was like living the Lorax story, but in, what was it, 1900, I think, Bill? Mm -hmm. They took down okay. all the pine trees, all the cypress trees for you know lumber purposes. Literally, it was a boom town that lasted for 20 years. So then they left when they ran out of trees. And what came up in its place were a lot of these um, sand hill uh, live oaks. So they're native, but they popped up as opportunistic weeds, you know. So um, in areas where they're trying to restore it to what it was originally, some people get upset if you take down certain trees and put down, you know, just pine trees. But that is what they're trying to do is to restore it 
to its original, uh, you know, how it was, how nature created it. Yeah, people get upset when they look at an area and it's filled with oak trees and they say, we're going to burn it because we want to get rid of the oak trees. Oh, my gosh. Trees are wonderful. Well, they are, but you should have the right tree in the right place. Mm -hmm. If that area should naturally, because of the soil and environment and everything else, be pine sand hill, probably want to try to revert it back to pine sand hill. Right. But like in the downtown Brooksville area, like you were talking about, that is an oak hammock. So therefore there's oaks, you know, it's a much more moist area. It has the waters going through it, you know, so it depends on, you know, nothing is just blanketed. This is how Florida is just like anywhere else. You have microclimates all over the place. The Chazowitzka wildlife management area is very close to my home and somewhere hidden in there is the old mill, which I've been to once. <laughs> because somebody took me there, uh, where that, the town of Centralia was. That, what the road is just named after the, the town that once was. Mm -hmm. um, but all through Centralia is, you know, the Sand Hill Pine area, and then boom, swamp, completely different kind of area. And then Sand Hill yeah, Pine, uh, and boom, you're in the swamp again. Because that's getting to the marshes, the further west you're going to go, you're going to be eventually in the Gulf. In fact, in there in that woodsy area one of the trails is called old bayport road which fascinates me i want to look up that history like 100 years ago did they take that road you know to get to bayport obviously so yeah it, it climates can change geography can change all over in fact i saw and i did i show you the picture of the loblolly bay i yeah yeah found in, you can see it and they're getting more and more rare because of that um isn't it the ambrosia beetle or what is it that's going after the bay trees it's the ambrosia beetle mm -hmm. and most of the actual bay trees are gone what you had was a type of um <clears throat> native magnolia right yeah well, they call yeah, it bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. they're, they're, they're fine. They're okay. fine. Um, but it was pretty much danger. They're not being wiped out or anything. Too. So if you, mm -hmm. you know, you have to have a very, very wet area to have that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and it's so any, fun to say. Anywhere yeah. in Spring Hill is not swampy. <laughs> swampy plants are not going to do very well in Spring Hill unless you create a swamp somehow or have a garden pond or, you know, take steps to do that. Or if you're west of 19, where you, you know, start getting marshy. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm going to take that as a compliment. That I'm Lily's starting to sound like Bernie. Maybe she means kind of Cliff Claveny. <laughs> That's probably what it is. <laughs> way back in 1900. <laughs> I remember way back when. And by the way, for the record, I was not here when the town of Centralia was booming. <laughs> Thank you. Very informative. Thank you. Yes, Lily did not live in Centralia. <laughs> no. Very informative, cool. like always. Yes. That's so, guys, it looks like it's kind of sort of getting to that time of day. Um, but that's why Bernie and I can talk all day long. <laughs> <too>. <laughs> I will be back here again next Thursday. Let me double check. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to be on here. But Lily will be out of town. No, just on vacation. I won't be out of town. Where are you going? Nowhere. I just said that. Oh, you're not going anywhere? My grandson is flying in, and I'm going to be entertaining him. I'm thinking maybe one of the things we'll do is go to the Clearwater uh, Marine Aquarium. Because I've never been there. So. And, you know, maybe up to the Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. But that's a long drive. A lot of gas. Yeah. So. Traffic's always really bad in Gainesville. <laughs> it's summer, though. Should be not be too bad. The only time I've ever been up there where when I went on campus, it was a ghost town. There was like 
two or three cops and two or three cars, and that was it. The week between Christmas and New Year's. Oh, okay. Nobody is there at all. They're all gone. <laughs> <laughs> the parking lots are empty. So any other time of year, eh, it's not, yeah. not as easy to get in and out. So I will be here again next Thursday. So if anybody has any uh, questions, feel free to email me pictures, email us questions. We'll try to help you out and find you an answer. And if it's something you want answered here live on Thursday morning on the virtual plant clinic, let us know. We could do that. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have all week now to think of the hardest questions. Since I won't be here, it is uh, your... Uh, Homework is to go find the hardest questions you can bring back to Dr. Lester. And we'll forward them to Lily. So <laughs> she can work on them when she gets back. <laughs> okay. I guess that's about it. Monique, you're very welcome. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you so much for following us on a regular basis. Be sure to tell all your family and friends and everybody else to tune in. Mm -hmm. And I will see you again next week. Until then. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.